Good evening, friends. Um, thank you so much for joining me here tonight. And um, thank you, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to this event and um, for all your great assistance um, in uh, helping me prepare. Um, I'm a, a professor emeritus of English from Oakton Community College um, and a lifelong lover of literature and language. Um, I'm a native Chicagoan, but I lived in Arizona for uh, seven years. And there I learned um, really so much more about the flora and fauna of that region than I had known about my own prairie homeland. Um, but now that I've been back, um, back in Chicago for many, many years, um, I now uh, understand the language of the black-eyed Susies as well as I do of the uh, desert saguaro and that amazing aromatic sage um, from the desert. Um, at this time of day, um, I, I think you're probably ready for, for a space in which to retreat, um, to rest, to restore, to restore your energy, to restore your spirit a little bit. Um, so I'd like to invite you to transition with me to a place of quiet, uh, a place of reflection and contemplation, um, where there are few distractions and where we can experience together some moments of inspiration, perhaps, um, that connect us to nature in both an ecological and an emotional and even a spiritual way. Um, in this exploration, uh, contemplative poetry, a way into restoration, I'm focusing on some contemporary women poets who have written of our longings for wholeness, for oneness, uh, of our gratitude for the beauty all around us. Um, but it's not that other poets have not written on the same theme. Um, but this evening, by embracing the feminine voice, um, we're reverencing our Mother Earth, uh, the mater, the matter of all, of all being, the birther of all things. Um, Alice Walker, American poet, novelist, social activist, and a woman who over 30 years ago coined the term womanist uh, to describe herself and other black feminists and feminists of color, uh, wrote a beautiful poem titled, We Have a Beautiful Mother. And it pays homage to the earth, which is the mother of all things. We have a beautiful mother, Alice Walker. We have a beautiful mother. Her hills are buffaloes, her buffaloes are hills. We have a beautiful mother. Her oceans are wombs, her wombs oceans. We have a beautiful mother. Her teeth, the white stones at the edge of the water, the summer grasses, her plentiful hair. We have a beautiful mother, her green lap, immense, her brown embrace, eternal, her blue body, everything we know. Throughout our time together this evening, I'll be reading several poems, four, um, and I'll be inviting you to listen, to reflect, and to respond. Um, you may want to write your responses in your own, you know, journal, whatever scraps of paper you may have in front of you. Um, but I really want to encourage you to write your responses in the chat uh, box. And, um, and those things, everything that you put into the, the chat box will be uh, recorded and um, will become the material for the collective poem that uh, we will produce in our time together tonight. Um, that I won't be able to give you the, um, the finished product of the poem uh, this evening, but as I said, all of this is going to be recorded and given to me and I will sculpt it and the organizers will, um, will be sending you a link or something so that you will all be able to 
to uh, get the poem ultimately. Um, so anyway, I, I just want to encourage you to, to do that, to, to write in the chat. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, and this, uh, to begin, um, I'd like to um, lead us through a little exercise that is in the tradition of the Benedictine monks um, and others. And um, it's called stasio, which means station, literally means station. And um, it's meant to help us transition our attention from those things that are without, those things that um, we have been involved in up till now, and um, to pause and with intention to move into this new activity. Um, and so this exercise, I'm, I'm going to say uh, a single sentence. Um, it actually con combines a verse, uh, a line from a verse from uh, Buffy St. Marie's song, Circling Together, and a verse from the Psalms. And um, I'm going to, to say it several times uh, but just let me let me just say it for you once so you know what you're going to be hearing. Um, that sentence is, be still and know that we are circling together. And I'm going to invite you to repeat it after me. Um, as you know, nobody can see you, nobody can hear you. The only way we can uh, I can hear you or see you is through the, the chat room. Um, so, I'll say the sentence and you'll repeat it after me. And each time I say it, I'll leave off part of the end, part of the ending of the sentence. And then you will repeat that again and that again. Um, and you may want to close your eyes. You may want to um, just repeat it in your head. Um, you may want to say it very softly out loud. Um, and it will serve, I hope, um, as a slowing down, as a pausing, like a train pulling into a station, stasio, um, and as a transition, letting people off, picking up new passengers, and continuing on to the next stop. Um, for us, obviously, we're stopping our busyness of today's activities and moving into the next session not with a sense of, oh man, I got to do this. It's seven o'clock. I told Deb I'd be here. No, it's late. No, I'm hoping that we're going to move into it with a sense of, I will be present now in what I'm going to do next. So take a deep breath and um, remember to breathe throughout. I have to remind myself to do the same thing. Um, let's begin and please repeat after me. Be still and know that we are circling together. Be still and know that we are circling. Be still and know that we are. Be still and know. Be still. Be. The first poem that I'd like to share is by Patricia Luneta. Um, and just let me say that I'm not going to put the poems up on the screen. Um, but I'm just going to ask you to listen, to, to listen as Ursula Le Guin suggests with one of our lesser senses. Um, it's very, very hard when you put something in front of people who read to not read that thing. Um, and I feel that um, it'll be a, it would be a distraction. Um, it would interfere with that listening of the heart that, that um, contemplative poetry asks you to do. Um, but uh, again, <clears throat> at the end of this, at the end of this presentation, and you'll be able to get um, a recording of it and also a list of all the references that I will be um, 
uh, using this evening. I will, I'll tell you the titles of poems and the names of authors, but there will be a list of my, uh, my resources at the end of the, at the end of the session. Um, <clears throat> so let's follow the advice of um, the Ojibwe who have this proverb, um, listen to the wind, it talks. Listen to the silence, it speaks. Listen to your heart, it knows. This poem, uh, the narr for the narrator, it's also a time of transition. Um, not only is it the end of her long working day, um, she's heading home, but um, it's also evening. And it's the time when uh, the ancient Celtic people called thin. Um, when the veil between day and night is almost transparent. Um, and in fact, a time when with mindful quieting and waiting, sometimes that veil may be lifted entirely. And we experience a joy of complete connectedness with everything that is around us. So this poem is called The Visit, um, and it's by Patricia Lunetta. As I drive home on a narrow curving road, someone tailgates, itching to go faster, not knowing he's flesh and fragile. Slowed by sadness and sick of pressure, I pull onto a gravel shoulder, let him shoot by, and on my right, catch sight of a great blue heron. Standing tall and still in the aisle made by two rows of towering trees, like a priest in feathered robes. He bows his head three times before an altar of mountain bluffs. It's dusk and the moon just rising illuminates his wings as they open in benediction for the evening flight. His parting call, stay awake for holiness may spread its wings for you at any moment. Before I read it again, I'd like you to write down in the chat room or in your own little notebook, whatever, um, what image was particularly strong or memorable for you um, as you listen to this poem? And I'll type that uh, question in here again. Mm, let's see. <laughs> Or another, um, another idea or something that you might want to respond to is um, just what, what feeling, what, uh, yes, what, fe what feeling did you have um, in hearing this poem? Listen. <clears throat> We'll take a few minutes um, after each poem for you for you to put some comments. So wonderful! I see all these beautiful, <laughs> beautiful images coming back to me. Um, and uh, for your um, for those of you who may not want to be writing, um, that's you know completely fine. You might just want to be listening. But some of these pauses may feel very long to you if you're if you're just sitting there waiting, you know, waiting for people to to get through and for Deb to, for me to read the next uh, poem. Um, and for people who are writing, it may feel like it's just zipping, you know, zipping by too quick. 
Um, but anyway, we'll um, we'll pace ourselves, and uh, and I just want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to respond. Um, okay, so. Um, I'm going to put some what I what I would have typed in there. Um, I think was that tailgating driver. Oh, do I hate tailgating <laughs> drivers? Um, and I'm so glad that that lady pulled over. <laughs> um, so this time, this time, as I say the poem, um, I'd like you to to listen for any echoes that it may produce um, of your own experience. Um, let that rattle around a little bit as I read it again. The Visit by Patricia Luneta. As I drive home on a narrow curving road, someone tailgates, itching to go faster, not knowing he's flesh and fragile. Slowed by sadness and sick of pressure, I pull onto the gravel shoulder let him shoot by and on my right catch sight of a great blue heron standing tall and thin in the aisle made by two rows of towering trees. Like a priest in feathered robes, he bows his head three times before an altar of mountain bluffs. It's dusk and the moon just rising illuminates his wings as they open in benediction for evening flight. His parting call, stay awake. Holiness may spread its wings for you at any moment. Again, take just a couple minutes here. Um, and you might perhaps think of uh, some time that you took a pause and uh, it yielded a kind of unexpected visitation. Um, maybe you have a ritual or a plan that you, um, that you observe at that transition hour, that twilight hour, that thin hour um, between day and night. Um, maybe, you, maybe you were forced off the road at some point and, um, and found another found another path. <clears throat> while you're while you're writing that, I'll I'll just give you an example from my own experience that um, <clears throat> one sunny afternoon in Chicago I was hanging up the laundry in the backyard. One of my favorite things to do is to go outside and hang up laundry. And um, <clears throat> I heard a call from above sort of like this, and um, <clears throat> I stopped and, uh, and I looked up and I saw half a dozen sandhill cranes winging overhead, calling as they headed south, I suppose, very, very close above me. And um, when I recall that moment, <clears throat> excuse me, I, um, I really get sort of breathless. Um, it was such it was such a beautiful moment that I, if I hadn't stopped, if I hadn't attended to the sound, if I hadn't listened um, and looked up, I would have missed it. I would have missed that beautiful feeling, that sense of being really part of that of that wonderful moment. Um, and. <clears throat> throughout throughout time, um, mystics of all of all cultures um, have been deeply affected by a sense of wonder as they contemplate the presence of the holy um, in all of creation. Um, from ancient times, people have had an acute awareness of their connection to living in the natural world, um, an awareness of their deep, deep connection to all things. Um, and this awareness, I feel, has been adopted by our modern 
um, ecological and restoration movements. Um, and within, within, within these movements, the people carry these beliefs forward about our connective, connectedness to all things, um, planting seeds along the way, working actively, and with sometimes um, a near religious commitment to the health and survival of our communities. I'd like to return now to um, Alice Walker, who movingly captures the joy of finding such profound connections um, in the next passage that I'm going to read. Um, in her writing, Alice Walker uh, lifts the borders, in a sense, between prose and poetry, as well as between all of the things that exist on Earth. In her Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Color Purple, about the struggles of African-American women in the Jim Crow Georgia of the 1930s. Um, she has two characters, uh, Celie and Suge Avery, who are struggling against terrible oppression um, as women, as African-American women in the South. And um, they often talk, they often talk of what uh, they need and what they believe in, in order to survive, um, in order to get over um, in this difficult life that they have. And um, in this passage that I'm going to read, um, Celie is confessing to Suge Avery, who is her friend, who she has sought refuge with. She's just escaped a very brutal, abusive relationship, um, and who ultimately becomes Celie's lover. Um, she confesses to Suge that, uh, she says, I lost interest in God when I found out he white. But Suge responds, ah, Celie, I believe God is everything, everything that is or ever was or ever will be. And when you can feel that and be happy to feel that, you found it capital I. My first step away from that old white man was the trees, then air, then birds, then other people. But one day when I was sitting quiet and feeling like a motherless child, which I was, it come to me, that feeling of being part of everything, not separate at all. I knew that if I cut a tree, my arm would bleed and I laughed and I cried and I run all around the house. I knew just what it was. In fact, when it happened, you can't miss it. So I'd like to ask you to, um, to try to put words to that feeling that Shug is talking about. What, what is she experiencing? What did she experience in that moment where she says, I knew just what it was. And in fact, when it happened, you can't miss it. What, what is that? I was, you know, each time that I read these um, <clears throat> these pieces, I, you know, something else stands out or, or I have a, a little bit of a different take on it. And um, this time I felt, um, I felt that Shug was, Shug was uh, experiencing a vision of the divine uh, within herself that she, that she's able to see, not the, 
you know, um, not the God that sits on a throne somewhere, but this divinity that is within her, the sacredness that is all around um, within and without. Um, and I, be I believe that to uh, restore the ecological health and balance of our environment, um, we need also to restore the health of our spirit and I, I, uh, or our, our hope, if you will. Um, and I think Shug's uh, profound experience of this oneness, of this interconnectedness of all living things um, is the result of listening with an open heart. Um, and it's the healing of our being that leads to a longing for the doing of ecological restoration, returning, stewarding our planet to its health. I'm going to read the. Did I read this twice already? No. Okay. So I'll just read it one more time. Um, I lost interest in God when I found out he white. Shug responds, ah, Seely, I believe God's everything, everything that is or ever was or ever will be. And when you can feel that and be happy to feel that, you've found it. My first step away from the old white man was the trees, then air, then birds, then other people. But one day when I was sitting quiet and feeling like a motherless child, which I was, it come to me, that feeling of being part of everything, not separate at all. I knew that if I cut a tree, my arm would bleed. And I laughed and I cried and I run all around the house and I knew just what it was. In fact, when it happened, you can't miss it. There's also, there's also a surrendering in a way that, um, that has to take place at these um, moments of, of contemplation. Um, I refer to it sometimes, uh, I will refer to it sometimes this evening as a, an open heart. Um, but it's, I think it's touched on really, really well in this next poem. Um, it's called the avowal, one word. I, I have to pronounce it with a little bit of a Southern accent for it to be, to sound like A-V-O-W-A-L, avowal. Um, it's a poem written by Denise Levertoff, who was born in Essex, England um, educated completely at home, um, eventually moved to the United States where she not only became a citizen in 1956, but quickly involved herself in the transcendentalist uh, movement and in progressive political causes. Her father was a Hasidic Jew who ultimately converted to Christianity and became an Anglican parson um, in the town uh, where she was born, I believe. Um, her mother was a Welsh nurse who served as a civilian in World War II. The Avowal by Denise Levertov. As swimmers dare to lie face to sky and water bears them, as hawks rest upon air and air sustains them, so would I learn to attain free fall and float into the creator spirit's deep embrace, knowing no effort earns that all surrounding grace. I'm gonna read this poem again right away um, and ask you to, to focus on the emotions uh, the overall sense of this poem. Um, 
and perhaps write a word or two in the in the chat room about about what you what you're feeling uh, from this poem. The avowal, Denise Lebertoff. As swimmers dare to lie face to sky, and water bears them. As hawks rest upon air, and air sustains them. So would I learn to attain free fall, and float into the creator spirit's deep embrace, knowing no effort earns that all surrounding grace. For me, um, I, this poem makes me remember the first um, job I ever had, which was as a uh, junior lifeguard and swim instructor. And, um, and I remember so vividly um, the, the trust, the confidence that had to be engendered in those little swimmers um, in order for them to allow me to remove my hands from under their little floating bodies, you know. And when that finally happened, that spectacular moment of being supported by the water, being supported by the breath in their lungs, um, trusting, feeling the joy of floating. Just a really beautiful, beautiful, wonderful experience. Um, and it was, I had to earn that trust. I never took my hands away before they were ready, before they knew that I was going to take my hands away. So it's a great surrender. Um, let's see i have to find where i am <laughs> papers um i would have written in the chat room um surrender and trust um, i'm seeing all these wonderful <laughs> wonderful things go by i'm sorry i can't pay respond to them at this moment you know but um they're just beautiful and you can see you can see that the poem is writing itself our collective poem our collective experience our collective responses is being written um, by each of you as we as we share this this evening together um and as i said i will I will be so delighted to um, to look through all of this um, and to to sculpt in whatever way I can um, the collective poem that will um, that will be a reminder of our of our time together this evening. <clears throat> um, the last poem that I would like to read is. Um, by one of my favorite poets and writers of children's literature, young adult literature, uh, whose name is Naomi Shihab Nye. And uh, she has received many, many awards um, for her poetry and her, her fiction, um, including the Jane Addams Book Award, which is given for children's literature that promotes peace, social justice, and equality. Uh, Naomi Shihab Nye's father is Palestinian. Um, her mother is American. Um, they live in South Texas, I believe. Um, and uh, Naomi Shihab Nye spent her high school years um, in Ramallah, West Bank, Palestine. <clears throat> I heard her read at a national conference of teachers of English um, and I was so moved by her authenticity, um, her invitation really to the audience to uh, experience along with her the transformation of the details of everyday life into poetry. Um, 
This next poem that I'll be reading uh, is based on a real experience that she had um, in which following a talk that she, she gave in an eighth grade class, I believe in San Antonio, Texas, um, a boy from the class came up to her and handed her a folded note and, um, and walked away. And uh, this poem is going to be a response to what that note was, which she took home with her. Um, it's funny because after the conference, when I, when I heard her read, um, I wrote to her too. I wrote to her and um, I wanted to tell her how uh, affected I was by her poetry, um, particularly how appreciative I was at its um, accessibility and how I used her work um, in my classes for English as a second language students. Um, and it was very uh, evocative for them as well. <clears throat> um, and after a short time, she responded to me. I got an email from Naomi Shihab Nye and um, she explained a little bit about her writing process. And uh, she told me that um, in giving her writing away, she always got something back from it. Um, and she wished me a lot of good luck in my teaching. Um, like Alice Walker, Naomi Shihab Nye walks that line um, very calmly and confidently between prose and poetry. So I would like to read this poem and it's called Valentine for Ernest Mann. And the boy in the class's name was really Ernest Mann. Valentine for Ernest Mann by Naomi Shihab Nye. You can't order a poem like you order a taco walk up to the counter, say, I'll take two, and expect it to be handed back to you on a shiny plate. Still, I like your spirit. Anyone who says, here's my address, write me a poem, deserves something in reply. So I'll tell you a secret instead. Poems hide. In the bottom of our shoes, they're sleeping. They are the shadows drifting across our ceilings the moment before we wake up. What we have to do is live in a way that lets us find them. Once I knew a man who gave his wife two skunks for a Valentine. He couldn't understand why she was crying I thought they had such beautiful eyes. And he was serious. He was a serious man who lived in a serious way. Nothing was ugly just because the world said so. He really liked those skunks. So he reinvented them as Valentines and they became beautiful, at least to him. And the poems that had been hiding in the eyes of the skunks for centuries crawled out and curled up at his feet. Maybe if we reinvent whatever our lives give us, we find poems. Check your garage, the odd sock in your drawer, the person you almost like, but not quite, and let me know. So <laughs> I'd like to ask you right now, um, look around you, look around you, look up, look down, look out the window, um, look at everything that is surrounding you, look at the people you may be sitting with, sitting across from sharing space with, and tell me where a poem is hiding right now. Tell me where a poem is hiding. Please chat it into the chat it into, <laughs> write it into the chat room. <clears throat> where? Where is a poem hiding? Right now. Mm, 
I see someone that um, someone wrote in their rocking chair, and that's what I was going to. That's what I was going to say. In my rocking chair, there's a poem hiding. <laughs> this is beautiful. This is wonderful. This is such gorgeous poetry here. <laughs> You didn't realize, you didn't realize what, what poets you all are. So I'm gonna read it one more time. Uh, this will be the last reading for, for this session. Um, and at the end of the session, I'll, uh, at the end of this reading, I'll ask you to continue looking for poems, but also um, to consider what some people in your life um, in your sphere, perhaps, um, may have called ugly, um, but what to you is quite beautiful. Valentine for Ernest Mann, Naomi Shihap Nye. You can't order a poem like you order a taco. Walk up to the counter, say, I'll take two, and expect it to be handed back to you on a shiny plate. Still, I like your spirit. Anyone who says, here's my address, write me a poem, deserves something in reply. So I'll tell you a secret instead. Poems hide. In the bottom of our shoes, they're sleeping. Drifting across our ceilings, the moment we wake up, before we wake up. What we have to do is live in a way that lets them, lets us find them. Once I knew a man who gave his wife two skunks for a valentine. He couldn't understand why she was crying. I thought they had such beautiful eyes. And he was serious. He was a serious man who lived in a serious way. Nothing was ugly, just because the world said so. He really liked those skunks. So he reinvented them as valentines and they became beautiful at least to him, and the poems that had been hiding in the eyes of skunks for centuries crawled out and curled up at his feet. Maybe if we reinvent whatever our lives give us, we find poems. Check your garage, the odd sock in your drawer, the person you almost like, but not quite, and let me know. While you're, while you're writing, <laughs> um, I'm going to, sorry to talk over your, your thoughts, um, but I wanted to share with you uh, something that had been kind of frightening and ugly to me um, until, uh, until I had a transformation and found it then beautiful, um, and that is a possum. And uh, I don't know about you, but I had many, many, many times heard people say, possum, ugh, what an ugly animal. It's disgusting. It's like a rat. Looks like a rat. Pointy nose, that awful uh, hairless tail, um, sitting on top of my garbage can, freaks me totally out at nighttime. Um, and I got to admit, I've, I sort of felt the same way about possums. Um, but then, uh, some decades ago, so this a long time ago, my mind was changed. Um, my feelings were changed about that possum. Um, I read an article uh, in the Reader, the Chicago Reader, in a column called uh, "Street, um, Street, uh, No Field and Street, Field and Street," um, and it was an essay about the possum. And I learned that um, the possums that we see in our region are really pushing the farthest, you know, they're pushing the northern reaches of their uh, range. And it's really tough for them. It's really tough for them here in our climate, the temperatures of Chicago, like this one, um, because they don't hibernate. And they have, to, they have to go out of their little dens and seek food to survive the winters in this frigid, frigid cold and snow. Um, 
I also learned that besides their tail being hairless, their ears are hairless. And the writer, the writer of this article um, describes with great tenderness the possum's ears. The possum's delicate, lovely pink ears that curl and fold up when it sleeps and reinflate when it wakes are often black tipped, nibbled by frostbite. The, the writer ponders as he walks through the woods, continues to walk through the woods. These creatures hold up and shut down their most pink and fanciful and delicate accessories, ragged and exposed like flowers in the snow. How could you not love a possum after that? With beautiful, beautiful creatures and beautiful ears. <laughs> as, we, um, as we finish up our responses, uh, I'd also like you like to invite you to make any comments you would like, um, write any questions you would like me to answer. Um, I won't answer them this evening, but um, but as I said, all of this will be given to me, and I will put together um, our collective poem, and I will respond to you uh, about your questions. And you will be able to access that, I believe, um, from a link that the, the Wild Things uh, organizers will send out to everyone who has participated in the conference. Um, and I'd like to, um, I, I hope, anyway, I hope that the collective poem uh, that we have written tonight together will be a reminder of what has been birthed from our, from our being still and our circling together this evening, uh, a reminder of our profound connectedness um, to each other and to all, all living things, to our planet. Um, and I hope that our collective poem will be an example of, um, and this is really the inspiration <laughs> for me that, um, that made me put this presentation together, um, that it will be an example of how through the word, through the word, through contemplative poetry, we can restore and we can be restored. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, have a wonderful evening. Good night. Thank you so much, Debbie, for this really replenishing evening. Um, I'm just gonna put up a slide with some of Debbie's references and that'll be it for the evening. Thank you everyone for participating and we'll see you in the morning. Bye.